Welcome to Armchair Preaching, a podcast of the First Presbyterian Church in Lakeland, Florida. This is a podcast about God's Word, the beauty of the Gospel, and what it takes to communicate that truth to others. I'm your host, Pastor Zach McGowan, and on today's episode, Pastor John and I discuss the impact of the Disquiet series, and we discuss this week's messages in our services. We hope you enjoy the conversation. Welcome back, everybody, to Armchair Preaching today uh, with Pastor John in a virtual space. Um, John, should we tell people how long it took us to get this uh, this report? Yes, we should tell them. It's been quite quite an effort. We've learned a lot. (laughs) You know, and and we were saying right before, uh, we thought that the one advantage to COVID was that we got to learn how to do all these things really efficiently and then... I just blew that hole out of the water. We, we did not do this efficiently at all, but here we are. And uh, uh, prayerfully, this is going to record nicely and be able to be edited nicely and, and be, uh, be, 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 be good for folks at home uh, and as they're participating themselves in a virtual space, because they're not with us either. They're watching this online or listening to this on their phones. So technology, right? That's uh, it's well, okay. we uh, and and the one technology that we did use primarily when we did these recordings in the past uh, was did not work today. And did not so work. We, we had to we had to learn a new platform and Should make do. a new platform work, which meant we had to up, up do some upgrades. So it was it's been quite an endeavor, but yeah. we're here. Yeah. Well, you know, it, it's uh, it's appropriate as we're doing a series on stress and anxiety. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, we got to practice that a few for a few minutes. Yeah, yeah. So um, I should say I'm I'm off site. I'm at a hotel just outside of Miami. I'm having a, a day with my I had a day with my son yesterday or evening with my son yesterday. We went to a concert and um, finishing up the morning. He's getting some schoolwork done. I'm getting some work done here. And but we're we're doing this because we've got folks that are relying on this for their small groups on Wednesday and people who rely on it for their groups on Sundays. And so we want to make sure we get this done. So I appreciate you taking that time, John. Well, thanks for being the championing the, the technology too. Yeah. So uh, we have been in the series called Disquiet for now. We've done three sermons. Uh, we're just past the halfway mark. Um, uh, four sermons now. We're just past the halfway mark. We just passed week four. Um, we just want to just uh, uh, talk with you a little bit about what you have heard um, from people. And uh, I know we've been in conversations with a lot of different groups of people about the importance of this series and people's own anxieties and stresses. And, you know, what have you been hearing from people about what they're primarily, you know, what triggers their anxiety, what triggers their depression, what triggers their, their stress more often than not? Have you been, you've been hearing from people throughout the series? Yeah, uh, well, first off, people are saying that they are appreciative about how practical this series is, is that uh, is that it, it is certainly biblical. We're looking at biblical characters, and we are looking at their lives, and we're seeing in their lives that they were going through the same kinds of things that, that many of us go through regularly in our lives. And and out of that, we were able to learn from them and to see see in them not just what they did, but what God does uh, with them. So people have, have, a number of people have commented on how practical it is. Um, and yeah, the people have come up and, and talked about the uh, the importance of the series, um, either explicitly or because I know them and I know what they've been going through, sort of implicitly said, it has been helpful for me going through what I'm going through. And the kind of things that they're going through, I think are the kind of things where I, I think we both have referenced them at some point in the last four weeks. But um, the one thing that maybe we, we haven't emphasized as much in terms of anxiety um, and really hasn't come up in conversations, but I know just from looking at any number of reports that are out there, they are real. They're, these are things that people are dealing with. Um, it's just the, the 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 financial anxiety. There's a lot of uh, anxiety around the cost of living and the, the, the cost of groceries and gas and the basic things of life. And uh, and so I know that that's a real thing. I know just from looking around, listening to family and friends and just looking around the rest of the world that that's an, that's an issue. But um, these other things are issues as well. These are these are all real uh, th- things pe- people are dealing with um, with, with uh, family issues. 
where they are stressed, they find stress about parenting is hard, you know, being in marriage, you know, living with another person is hard, living around other people is hard, and just being human and together is is messy and, and is hard and has its own source of anxiety. And I think it's been uh, that I think it's been, if anything's been the refrain of what's been most useful about this, just dealing with difficulties in human relationships and how we might sort of push through those. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, how about and I you? Think, yeah. One of the words that keeps coming up um, as I've talked to folks about what they're dealing with is this word is the word balance. Uh, people are, they're just feeling off balance, you know, mm. whether, it, whether it's work, like, like you said, whether it's work, family balance, whether it's, you know, financially, they, they don't feel like they can get ahead. Uh, and, and that's throwing them off. That's keeping them out of balance, whether it's, um, uh, you know, just, just even in themselves, you know, trying to get the balance in their own emotions. I think that's the word that I, I have heard from folks is just a lack of balance. And one of the things I feel like we have emphasized in the series is for the, and we haven't said it like this, and maybe this is some language that'll come up uh, in the next couple of weeks, is without the center point, you know, if your center point is off on, on a, on a, you know, on a lever, you're not going to have balance. If your center point is off on a scale, you're not going to have balance. And what this series is trying to do is to create that center point in Jesus Christ. You know, the, the, if that's strong, yeah. if that's strong, then everything else is going to be in balance. If, if that's wide and that's established in your life, that's going to have, that's going to create yeah. better, better ways to have balance. And, and I think that's what this has been about. And it's not that we don't believe people should go, you know, get the therapeutic help if they need to, or the medical help if they need to. You emphasized that uh, a couple of weeks ago in your message. Um, I mentioned that at the very at the beginning of mes our message, but that that we believe that even if those things are to be most effective, if the therapeutic is going to be most effective, if the medical intervention is going to be most effective, it's going to be most effective when it is founded on a faith-based relationship with Jesus Christ. And, and you know, I, I, I sense people are, are gravitating to that, you know, in this. And I think they're looking that. for something. They're, they're looking for that. They're looking for that grounding. Um, it reminds me of a story by uh, Max Lucado. He tells, a, tells about a storm that's just coming in, and there's a, somebody had a ship, and they were just trying to, tie that ship down to the to the dock you know with all these you know line after line after line tied down and an old sailor came up and said here's what you need to do so when you got a storm coming in like that you go out into 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 the, the open water and anchor deep mm -hmm. and that's what you were just describing i think that's what the series has been given he said is that when you anchor deep you anchor deep into something that's not you it's it's something that is beyond you and it's deep uh, but it's the thing that'll hold you in place when the when the storms are blowing all around. And I I do think that that's and I'm and I'd be curious because you you asked the um, you sent a note ahead of time and about this opening question and so I was looking around at even what the, what's happening in society and I've heard Dr. Sewich Paul Sewich talked about this pretty regularly. So I went and looked and found some statistics on this. Is that American Psychological Association last year said that uh, pre and post pandemic stress levels. So pre and post pandemic, think of in terms of anxiety, 18 to 34 year olds, pre pandemic, 26% of them talked about having uh, stress post pandemic. So this is now still, and I think it, it's not gotten any better, if anything, in an election year, and it gets, get, it gets worse um, at 35%. So, yeah. you know, from 26% to, to 34, 34%. Yeah, 35 to 44 year olds, 21% pre pandemic, 31%, you know, 10% jump uh, in anxiety levels, uh, 45 to 64 year olds, 18% to 22%. And the only ones sort of came out okay were the 65 plus. And that's not all, you know, not all of them because there's still 10% pre pandemic and 9% post pandemic. So the reality is, is that we live in a world that is seeing increases and i think that's part of the, the 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 importance of and helpfulness of this series we're seeing increases in the levels of stress in the society and i wonder if you could 
it, what your thoughts are on why do you think that this the, the what yeah. to what do you attribute the the post pandemic stress level increases well I, I think one of the things that that we we've mentioned in previous series um, and I think it's come up a bit in this series towards the beginning is that we have become a more isolated society and the pandemic made that worse. Now it, it, that was already on the increase even before the pandemic, you know, it, it's, it's the cliche, it's the, it's the, uh, you know, early 21st century cliche where we're, we're more connected than ever before, but lonelier than ever before. I mean, that's, yeah. that, that was happening before the pandemic. I mean, if, if that was happening here, and, you know, increase the pandemic went like now, now literally told us don't, don't, yeah. don't, don't, yeah. don't even look at each other's faces. Right. Yeah. yeah. The, so, these started it. Yeah. These started it. And then the pandemic just, just blew it out of the water. Well, and it, and, it, and I mean, it told us we, we, the, the, the nonverbal communication was that every single person that you are interacting with has the potential to kill you just by breathing on you. Yeah. You know, and, yeah. and, 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 and I'll tell you this, uh, you know, you mentioned one of the things that is not showing up in statistics because they haven't, uh, because it's hard to test this, but we're seeing it even in our children's ministry is, uh, kids who were, pan, you know, pandemic kids. And I, I thought pandemic kids, I don't mean pandemic babies. I mean, kids that were in early elementary school in the pandemic, think kindergarten, first, second grade. They were there 2020, 2021. We're seeing a, a massive increase in the arrested social development of those kids. We're, we're seeing it. I, I mean, I don't have a – if I was a social psychologist and not a pastor, this this would be what I would be studying right now is the, the, mm. rel the relative social uh, abilities of, of kids who are now third – who are now fourth and fifth graders uh, – as a you know, and so those are the kids that were in kindergarten, first grade. Well, and I ask a parent, um, because her, you know, she was talking to me about some of the challenges her son was facing, and I said, "What do you think this is?" Is and she straight up, she looked no hesitation. She said, "It's a pandemic." She said, wow. that, "She said those kids are the uh, you can't generation. You can't you you can't take your mask down. You can't hug your friend. Wow. You, you can't. I mean, so." And now they're, they're told you can, but they don't know how, right? So they, they lost some of that. So you're seeing, uh, and, and then, so what does that do? So that creates a, a, an, additional, an, a, an additional stress on parents when, as you know, I know, being a parent in general, in normal time is stressful. It's stressful, yeah. So, so now throw on top of it this developmental delay that every kid in that generation has experienced. We're not talking about developmental delays that are the result of some sort of genetic uh, you know, issue or, or some sort of a special need that, that's of that nature. We're talking about a societally learned uh, uh, delay and that's on that's in addition to that so that's social delays that's in addition to all of the the academic things that they lost during that time so then parents are dealing with that well it's a trickle down effect the other kids that were older and maybe navigated that world but they have siblings who are not navigating that so you've got this this ripple effect of of social anxiety that was already happening before the pandemic because we're this increase in loneliness and, and, it, and, and that's really, it's really why I started the way I started on Sunday was this idea of loneliness as a, as a mm -hmm. cycle of depression, because I, I just see that as, I don't say the biggest issue related to anxiety and stress, but I do think it's to your point, it's one of the biggest contributing factors, I think, to the anxiety and stress and why I feel like our church right now is seeing such incredible growth. And I don't, I don't want us to pat ourselves on the back because it's not us. It's the Lord. But people are gravitating towards FPC right now because what are we emphasizing? What have we been emphasizing over the last eight community months? Connection. Connection and community. community. And, yeah. and we're, we're creating more opportunities for that, and people are hungry for it. And people, yeah. and, 
And so now we're 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 navigating the the opportunities of okay, how do we account for this this wave of people? It's a great great wave of people who are saying no no, we want to be a part of a, a place that is emphasizing community and uh, it's exciting. But I but I think it speaks into what you know God answering the problem of loneliness in our society through the church. And, and I think that's why all of this is, you know, providential in, in God's economy. I do think this is the, this is an important series to deal with that, with, with that loneliness. And, and, and I don't know if this is the societal things are not, they don't seem primed to shift anytime soon. They're still going to be with us. The, the technology is still going to be the have the ability to make us closer than we've ever been before and further away from each other than we've ever been before. That, that doesn't shift. We then adapt to that, nor do the things that come out of the um, – you know, out of this ang- heightened anxiety, uh, I, you know, I know one one of the studies said that there was a I don't know twenty something percent increase in the number of adults who who, who are experiencing forgetfulness mm-hmm. and uh, and their inability <laughs> to concentrate on things. And I hear that these are these are I'm talking about things you hear. I hear the people saying, "Man, I don't know what I'm, I, I feel like I've got early Alzheimer's or something like that." It's like, yeah. you, "Dude, you're you're thirty five years old. You can't you can't." You can't, that can't be it. But, you Concentrating, know making decisions, me, all those things me, like that makes me feel a ton better because I, 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 I do. I mean, I, I'm, you know, I'm 44, but I, I, there are times when I go in and I'm like, what was I doing? Or, yeah. or you get really, dis, you know, you get really distracted. You start one project and then you get an interruption. But these are the signs of the, t- the times that we're living in, right? And I think these are these are all connected. And I and I really like your image of the. Um, of being, and I know this is, this is what we've been saying in our own ways uh, throughout this series, is that really when you find that grounding, Max Lucado, so if you anchor deep, if you find that sort of grounding in Christ, some of the this, the other things don't go away, but but our ability to to cope with those things and to deal with those things is rooted in something that is bigger than anything that we're seeing all around us. Uh, this is not the first time in human history that we've had crises in uh, in a culture or that people have been stressed out about a higher level of, of, of stress. It's just maybe it's the first time we we know more about it, but it's not the first time that that's that that's been true. And what has been what has also been true throughout history is that is that people who have faith they they latch onto something greater than any of these problems. And uh, and to the extent that we can communicate that, I think that'll be a continue to be a tremendously useful thing. I mean, it is for me. I mean, I yeah. see, I'm, I'm no different. Like you said, I'm no different than seeing the people lose their minds over the, you know, tonight is, was the vice president debate you know, between the vice presidential candidates uh, debating, you know, that people are, have just lost their minds over politics and over all kinds of things. Mm-hmm. And uh, that, that is the source of anxiety uh, at some level. And, uh, and, and I, I too am looking for something that is greater. So I, we get you and I get to speak about it, and yeah. uh, we also get to live it. We also get yep. to embrace it ourselves. Yep. Well, we're going to take a short break, and then when we get back, uh, we're going to be jumping into this week's message on Peter. Uh, great, great, great Love subject. The guy. Great subject this week. So we'll take a short break, and we'll come back in just a few moments. back. Uh, Pastor John, it was a great opening conversation, and I think it dovetails really into this week uh, really nicely because, you know, we, you, both of us kind of touched on the previous weeks, just kind of, land, you know, a little bit, little bit, little bit, but but what we see in, in Elijah and Moses and David and, and now this week, Peter, is that that desire to you know, get back to the the foundation of their relationship with the Lord. And Peter's situation is incredible. And I, and I love, you know, it was 
The, you know, last week I talked about the fact that sometimes your, our messages are more complementary than identical. This week, yeah. they were far more identical than, yes. Uh, yes. than, yes. than yes. the emphasis. We both, on, we both walked through the story. We start, had a different introduction, but we both yeah. walked through the story carefully. And where we, where we landed with the stories and what we said about them was very, very similar. Yeah, the emphasis on how failure can breed that sense of anxiety or depression or, or whatnot. And then, and then the, the, uh, the points at the end, uh, you, you added that the failure is not the enemy part, which I thought was, was, was really, was a really helpful, uh, way to comfort people. But then, you know, we can find comfort in Jesus and God meets us in the dark moments is almost the same, <laughs> same point. And then the purpose, obviously that, that so that's both landed we were, there, we both landed there. But I want to talk about, uh, your, you know, we, we, we both, I mean, we hit even some of the same exact notes of Peter's life, right. Uh, or Peter's ministry yeah. life. Right. And, and, and so we talked about, you know, his his background as a fisherman. And you know, everybody listening should should be reminded that we usually rarely do we talk to each other ahead of time. Yep. We have a we have an outline uh, that we that we we follow that has been published to everybody. So we're so we're all on the same page. Every all the music leaders and the worship leaders and and tech people they all on the same page. But uh, and it has a description of the of the text and the and the message of the day. But we don't. We don't. You and I don't sit down and talk. To, there are churches out there where pastors sit down and once a week, and they yeah. go over the Huddle. text together. Yeah. Yep. But uh, yeah, we 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 have the little the little description of the week, and and uh, we pray that you know we just pray God leads us where He wants us to go. Because again, we are we've got two sides, two separate, I say different sides of our congregation, and they have different you know varying needs. But this week we hit some of the exact same notes of Peter's life. And I wonder, yeah. you know, what was your thought about the, 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 the points, the air, you know, the places in Peter's life that you wanted to emphasize to build. I think we were both trying to paint a picture of who Peter was, right? Yes. We we're painting yes. that picture. We used some of the same words, passion, uh, I think braggadocious, Vo- vocal, vocal, yeah. vocal. Yeah. I mean, we used a lot of the same words. So what was it uh, in your mind, hitting the notes that you wanted to hit, the, the walking on water, uh, the, the great declaration of faith, you know, you are the Christ, the Son mm-hmm. of the living God, and then the get behind me say, and we, we hit some of the exact, I don't think we, I don't think we added anything for me. I don't, was there one that you did that I didn't do? I didn't, I didn't notice one. Well, you did. You did washing washing the feet. Um, I, I did. Think I you, did. I think you feet. you gave uh, you gave Peter a little more personality. Uh, you had his his mother in law and his wife in there. You had him washing his washing his feet, um, uh, being comforted uh, uh, later on. The way you talked about that, but but those were I mean, out of all the the collection. If we did a dozen descriptions of Peter, we had you know nine of them were the same. Yeah. Even yeah. where we went, and we again, we didn't talk about that. We just went to the same nine because, yeah, you, you're right. Because it, it was important to me that that if we're going to sh- paint Peter accurately, we need to paint his his tremendous failure. In fact, most of the things. In fact, I said this. I built up those to get to the failure mm-hmm. because the failure is pretty significant. That is, I mean, this is Jesus. This is Peter who walked with Jesus for three years, and then the minute. It gets tough. The minute he's he potentially has, has facing the risk of his own life, he's out. Yeah. And as you said, and this is another one. As you said, he wasn't even there when when uh, when the women were there. You know, that, that he wasn't there. They were. He was gone at the crucifixion itself. Well, and and I, uh, you know, I, I thought about this. I did a little, you know, kind of like a thought experiment. You know, and I this didn't end up in the message at all. But it's so much more powerful that it's Peter. Because of the 11 disciples, you know, obviously Judas is the betrayer. Of the 11 disciples, you have John, who is at the, is at the foot of the cross. Yeah. So you have 10 others. None of them, none of those 10 are with Jesus at the foot. Of the, all of them in some way denied Jesus. And I'm sure and this is again this is an imaginative sort of, this is like if i'm writing a script for the chosen this is what you know you're going to see you're going to see all 
of the other disciples also denying Jesus, people asking them. Mm-hmm. But it but it doesn't hit quite as hard in the gospel if what's recorded is Thomas's denial or Thaddeus's denial, you know, or James the Lesser's denial. Those yeah, are all, yeah. even even James or Andrew, you know, they all denied him in some way, but it hits really, really hard because it's Peter. Uh, and it's not it's well. You, not, you mentioned the past. The, you mentioned the G, John six. The uh, um, Jesus is saying, "Are you going to leave me too?" Yeah. And Peter's the one say, "Lord, where would we go?" This, there's I, this actually kind of funny if you think about it. He says, "Where are we going to go?" You have the words of victory. You know, it comes down to the wire. I'm going to go somewhere. I'm not. I'm, I'm, go not, I'm not here. I'm leaving. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So he doesn't. He, the very thing that he was he was bold about saying in John chapter six. By the time you get to the to the um, the end to yeah. the crucifixion he's done he's he's yeah. gone yeah and it's one of those so it, again, is, it, it is a very stark stark contrast and it's it's the stark contrast that stands out yeah and i and i think the other side of it too is how jesus is wanting to set peter up for the purpose which is where we we both landed because the purpose of peter was ultimately to be the the next great shepherd of the church you know he, he got jesus is having to get him to that place where he is, he, he uses all the passion, he uses all the confidence, but it's tempered with trust, reliance, and humility. And that only, it, it, it's, it, it's why I think it was so great that your first point is that failure is not the enemy, that God is actually going to work through the failure. Um, that's, that's, to me, I think, what stands out about about that particular thing is that the fail it, obviously God is not the author of sin and and God is not want that that we should sin and fail yeah. you can't attribute he, evil to to God yeah yeah but he knows we're going to and so he's going to use that to his ultimate glory All right yeah yeah um i, I want to spend a little time talking about the John 21 because Again, you and I both did the exact same thing. We just mentioned there's a ton we could talk about here, right? But the main point is— But the main point is— He was restored, yeah. Yeah, yeah he was restored. Yeah. And, and we both emphasized the threefold restoration. Um, right. What—I mean, was there any part of you that wanted to dig in in, in, this, in, the, in this sermon with the two types of uh, love language, you know, the love that are in there, the different— words yeah. for, or know that to know uh what you know all, yeah. all the different things that we mentioned was there any part of you that said uh oh, maybe this does maybe this is important for this week but ultimately said decided against it i, I did decide against it I, I i when i was taking greek in seminary and i came and we had to translate this passage I thought I was a. I thought I had discovered a secret that nobody had ever discovered before. <laughs> like, did everybody notice this? There's two That's different words for here. Good. This one's like agape, and this one is a phileo. They're two different. They're, they're two different words here. That's very significant. And I remember my Greek professor saying, "You know, p- p- scholars are mixed on this. Whether there's actually a lot of significance in that. Maybe Jesus was just kind of meeting him where he was." By yeah. softening it on the on the last on the last version of it, rather than some major theological shift that went on. So, so I know that there's some scholarship uh, uh, debates on the significance uh, of that, but it still is interesting to me. But it felt yeah. more like a Bible study. The, the answer to your question is, it felt more like a Bible study topic and something that you could have a little fun with and talk about in in the Bible study because it was you, you sort of go through that that those shifts to get to w- the end yeah. and the, to get to the end, which was as Jesus came, came all the way to where Peter was and he, and the, and he restored Peter for the failures that he, that he had been. And then he, and he put Peter to work. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I mentioned this where I mentioned this, but uh, oh, I was probably in the membership class the other day. The, I, it, I was thinking the Isaiah passage as well, yeah. where that, where, Peter's un- own sense of unworthiness was not unlike Isaiah's own sense of unworthiness being before the throne of God. And what and God is the one who comes to Isaiah, just like Jesus was the one who comes to, to Peter and says, I got a job for you. First off, you're good. Now I got a job for you. If you're good in that, I'm going to restore you, but I have work for you to do. 
Yeah. And then that was the in, in Peter's case, it was to is to is to lead my people, which, by the way, I love that uh, that that you um, you talked about Peter as the as the the next great leader of the the great leader of the early church and the Acts two first preacher of the of the church and all that. I and I, I was I was waiting. Is that going to build that out? Because that seemed like something. That, did you want to build out that like what I, that was going to be like? Okay, so so this is one of those we talked about this last week. That's one of those not in the notes in the moment wanting to re- remind people because I think we did. We did talk about Peter in at the, the the beginning, you know, the early church, like in a in a, in a recent previous series, right? Um, and and so it, it was it was still somewhat fresh in my mind this this idea uh, of Peter's, you know, vocal leadership being so profoundly necessary. Um, but you know the difference is now that it's tempered with this incredible humility. That that to me that was what I was really wanting to emphasize, and so I I hesitated to build out anything further than that because then it goes down to a whole nother thing. You know, it goes yeah, to a whole, yeah. whole other point, and 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 I think that's we we both felt the 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 sense of focus being primary here, which is that that sense of of God's comfort. Um, as you put it, um, meets us in the darkness. Uh, Jesus brings comfort, um, and and the purpose, you know, and and the purpose piece. Because I think when folks are dealing with debilitating anxiety, uh, which sometimes translates into a depression um, and a sense of I can't do this. You know, I'm going to wrap myself in a blanket. Is the image I was using, but they feel like they have no purpose. They're purposeless. Right. I mean, and that and, and and this is where you get the exegetical imagination, you know, thinking through. I mean, I loved how you painted the picture of the cowering in the dark rooms, you know, afraid that yep. they're be the, there. And you said the words they were all afraid and Peter, especially afraid that they were going to be next. You know, Jesus yep. has been crucified. And so the 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 exegetical creativity to say it wasn't as though Jesus died and everyone was like yeah okay we're good okay let's just go back to, no they were really afraid they were really scared and incredibly disappointed and and reeling about you know what did the previous three years mean what did the previous two days mean what, what you know going back through what did they miss you know what did what did they did what didn't they understand which was, we know is a lot. And of course, Jesus in his post-resurrection uh, meetings with the disciples kind of reteaches them everything yeah. he's taught them before yeah. and, and sets it in the context of, see, now I am alive. But in the, the moments before, he shows up in the upper room, shows them his hands and his feet. They are really undone. You know, just totally undone. And I and I loved how you painted that picture, which I didn't paint nearly as much. You know, I think because it does, it emphasizes the fear level. You know, and yeah. and, and I think that's that that's a, a real important point for a lot of folks. What what did you leave out? What did you not say as much of as, or, or, or what did you want to do more of, or just leave out altogether? Um, one thing that I was tempted to go into because it, well, there's two things. One, you, you did talk about David, which was in our, was in our pre sermon, uh, description. Uh, I didn't get back. I had it in my notes. I didn't get back to it. Um, I I opted to kind of just focus on the Peter side of it because I I just, I had a way to weave it in there because of the way you did it. I thought was, you know, the preparation for being the king because in that second Samuel passage, as he's anointed, as he's crowned king, not as he's anointed king, because he's already been anointed earlier, but as he's crowned king, the word, the, the words are, you will be a shepherd to my people, you know, now David already had, a shepherd background, but even all that he had gone through as in service to Saul just helped emphasize that. I didn't get to any of that. You did, and I thought that was really good. I, I didn't. 
The other thing that neither one of us got into, but I was tempted to because it did dovetail nicely with, with last week, and it is in the John 21 passages, right after Peter and Jesus have this exchange, you know, what does Peter say? What does Peter ask? Because it's, this is not a private conversation. This is a public conversation. And the, the, uh, what is indicated in the conversation is that Peter looks over at John and says, well, what about him? What about him? What about yeah. him? And I thought, man, if that's not competitive anxiety, and again, you just kind of want to be like, Peter, have you not learned anything? Right? I mean, it isn't. Ab- and Jesus just says, it's not about him. And, it's about and it's like, you. And, and we just had a moment, Peter. I know. Just like, come on. We just had a moment. Remember how you were, you know, the world went black and dark outside. And, and now, I mean, and now this? Yeah, just celebrate right. that. We just don't worry about him. And that, I, so I didn't. Yeah. I was tempted to do that because there there is something about the 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 continual failure that we sometimes have. You know, we are we we cycle back. Um, we're failures. Yeah. That we have we have depression. God restores us, brings us out of the darkness. We're in the light for a little a brief second, and then we're right back in the dark. You know, it's, but I, I I decided not to do that. I think it. I think that theme will come up a little bit this week as we, you know, dig into Paul's uh, issues. But uh, you know, what about you? What 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 else did you uh, leave off the off the off well, the script? Off the just a, one one sort of closing thought on what you're just saying. Uh, it, I, it reminds me that the time of Jesus says uh, talks talks about spatial spatially being spatially connected. He said, you know, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And and sometimes we are far by by they say okay you're close to whatever this whole movement is all about but other times with life you know maybe an hour later you might be oh no you're not close to what what it's about so there's you know there there are those there, that's a very human condition to be yeah, in very to be, human be weaving in and out out of that now one of the things that I um that I didn't do that I wish I, wish I would have done and I wish I would have had had more time for and I think it would have been useful and I. And I and I teased it out a little bit more in the live services. Is um, you know, I started with the Chuck Colson image, and I said that Chuck Colson had went from his power hungry self and defining his life based on where he sat relative to the people in the highest power in the world, to starting a prison ministry yeah. and being known for his testimony of all that he thought, all that he went through. So I love that it was the, it was the detail of what his life was like before and how God used what his life was like before to do something authentic and something real, something purposeful in his life. As uh, I think you mentioned, uh, celebrate recovery. I, I think did, you mentioned, yeah. yeah, you mentioned celebrate recovery. Yeah. Celebrate recovery. And that's something that you hear a lot of in celebrate recovery. They say, God, God take, took my failure, uh, and turned it into an opportunity to help others. Or as you said, to go help the broken. Well, they were the broken, and now the broken are helping the the broken. So it would have been I would have enjoyed probably taking another three or four minutes uh, in the sermon to to really build out. Okay, uh, maybe it's a failed marriage. What happens if your failure is in your and it's a spiritual failure first, and then it's a moral failure uh, that, that follows? What happens if that failure? Uh, is is redeemed and God redeems you through that through that failure. How does God turn that from uh, from a failure into a, a purpose? Uh, maybe it's a business failure that you've mm. that you've gone through, and some of it of your own doing. You know that you've been, you've made the, the worst possible choices, and um, and yet you know, the, there's there's redemption that that you would actually run a be a man or a woman of God. Uh, running a business, and how can you turn that failure into a a man of God or a woman of God who is leading now in in business in a whole different way? And so you turn it from a mess and into a into a into a ministry of of sorts. And you know all kind of, of, of friendships. You know you maybe you betrayed a friendship, you betrayed a account, you let down a friend, you broken broken a promise to a to a friend, or done something. Or or how about this one? You do this parenting. Um, mm-hmm. Every every week, this parenting group every week, you know, parenting. I mean, I can't, how many parents issue to themselves? I had the conversation this weekend. Issue to themselves the bad parent of the year award. Yeah, and there's usually a reason why they did because there was some failure on their part to, to do. So I can think of things to this day when my daughters were 
probably middle school that I wish I would have that uh, that would've, I would have handled that situation way differently than I handled it because it was just not a, 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 a gentle and good way of handling the, the situation. Well, maybe that then can be turned into something useful for the future. Uh, that yeah. God would God would use that redemptively. So so that that I think I would have had a good time spending more time on that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're going to take another break and then we get back. We're going to apply this for personal devotion and for group work. Um, So we're going to take a short break and we'll be back in just a moment. great discussion, Pastor John. And as we close out today's episode, we do want to help folks who are using this for their own personal study um, and group study. And so if if you're, again, you're talking to folks one-on-one or you're sitting down, just imagining us sitting in their small group, you know, what are some of the things that you're what would be interesting for people to unpack as they talk about Peter, as they talk about depression as they talk about their failures where where would you start well i, I would start with uh first question is how 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 intimate of a group is this yeah. how honest of a group is this <laughs> yeah because yeah. this is a this is a subject area where you know, if i'm going to talk about a failure in my life i got to trust you yeah. so uh, i probably would start with uh, with that is, is uh, how intimate are we and uh, you and i've been in groups plenty of time and you know the first time someone gets totally honest Mm. they give permission to the rest of the group to be totally honest as well because what they're saying with that is they is and i guess i'm even just saying this out loud i'm i'm describing that it would be useful for a group to ask themselves how how honest are we going to get yeah so that would be the first thing because you know when you when somebody gets up and starts talking about a fight they had with their spouse yeah. And they're honest about that about that fight, whatever the subject was. Then other people are willing to have honest conversations. So let's start there. But then I would go to uh, the specific question. Peter, we spent quite a bit of time describing P- Peter's bottoming out his over his own failure. And when 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 have you done that? Yeah. When, when have you when have you failed? Describe a time when you have failed at something. And probably could start it with a something general, but I would try to get us, move us to when have you failed spiritually? Yeah. And I think if you're, if you're with a group, uh, and uh, you know, I've done, I've led a lot of small groups and I, I, and it been, and I've been at that stage in the group where there's potential for kind of deeper conversation, but, but they're, but they're kind of on the cusp. And I usually try to start if, if I'm trying to get people to that point where they're really talking about their failures. I, I talk about my own first, and then, but, but even before that, I'll give people the opportunity to talk about something that's a little bit more um, not as serious a failure, you know, like you know, describe a time when you got a traffic ticket, you know, what was, yeah. you know, what was that like, or or describe a time where. You know what? What was the most embarrassing moment you had in school? Yeah, you know, yeah. and th- those kinds yeah. of failures. I let, I let the baseball team down by not you know, by striking yeah. out and that, yeah. you know, with three on base. Yeah, yeah. Or like I remember when I was in in uh, tenth grader, I I was, uh, you know, I was at I was in in the cafeteria, and this was a tiny failure, but it was pretty embarrassing. I had uh, I don't know what it is about cafeteria lunches it like I never drink chocolate milk but I drank chocolate milk all the time in cafeteria lunches and I put the tray down the 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 carton of chocolate milk was on the edge the weight was uneven and it and it spilled all over all like just straight down ah, right in the middle of you. the cafeteria and and it was you know I had early lunch which meant I ate lunch at like 10:45 and so I had the whole rest of the day where I was going to have to figure out what to do. And I ended up having to wear gym clothes the whole rest of the day, which, 
you know, it was kind of embarrassing, you know, <laughs> yeah. and, and it was, it was one of those moments where, uh, you know, I look back on it now and it was kind of funny slash stupid and, and, but it was, it felt pretty, pretty, pretty big deal back then. Right. And so if I'm in a group, I would start with things like that, you know, what, and then as you get into later in the conversation, move to the, the idea of, okay, now, 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 what are the, what are the, what are the, big, even, even uh, that, though, even that though, that's a, that's a, that's almost a group decision. Certainly a group leader decision is like, yeah. how far do we take this? Yeah. Like you're in a couple's group. Do you, know, is, is it too far in a couple's group to talk, begin talking about uh, your sex life? Yeah. Well, it's going to be an unusual group that's going to be ready to talk about that. It's probably something you need to, <laughs> I mean, you, you guys need to talk about that, but is it, but in a men's group, yeah. Would, would men talk about, you know, uh, issues that they have with their with, with, with their sex drives? They they I've been in a number of them that have uh, been been that candid about candid yeah. about things and always framed by what we're seeking is we're seeking the, 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 the life of Christ. Yeah. To be to to live the life of Christ. And yet this is a this is a thing that we're talking about. So I think what it's it's an important question to have in a small group is that how honest is this small group going to be about anything that we're actually struggling with? If we are struggling with finances, if we're struggling with with uh, wayward children, if we're struggling with with matters of of sex or fidelity or anything anything like that, if we're struggling with Pornography, you know, what, whatever that they are, are we going to be honest uh, as as a group? So I think that would be a yeah. really important question because it and, and it's and it's okay to have a boundary. Yeah, I don't I don't want to suggest that everybody you got you have to you have to be sharing everything. Everybody, someone no. your whole group needs to know every every cent of your life. I do think it's important for people to have for, for people to have people in their life who know their sins mm-hmm. fully. That's that's I think that is useful in the in the kingdom of God to have that. I'm not saying that they, the group needs to be that. I say group, but I do think the group should decide where our our, our boundaries we explicitly yeah. or implicitly decide. Yeah. yeah. So that's that's that all around the where have you failed question, and then where ultimately where have you failed spiritually? Yeah. How many and people I, and, do you know that have 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 uh, said I have not led my family well spiritually? Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've let the other spouse be the be the spiritual leader, and I've just been just tagging along for the ride. That's that's a that's an important, honest spiritual failure. Yeah, and God can re- restore that. And I think even if you're not if you're not in a group, um, or even if you are in a group that you plan on doing this in a group, to have that conversation with yourself and with the Lord, you know, there, a number of people who are journalers and, and, and really take some time to, to journal that out. You know, even if you're, even if you're not ready to talk about it in a group setting, um, or, or, you know, with, with a, with a trusted friend, uh, at least, at least have the conversation with yourself and have the conversation with the Lord. And I would look at the, if you get into the text, I, I think one of the most interesting questions to hear from people is what do they think Peter's biggest failure is in the moment of his denial. You know, is it the is it the actual denial it's, itself? I would encourage people. I did a little bit of this where you compare mm-hmm. Matthew's gospel with John's gospel. We did a little bit of this, but but go back and look at all the gospels because it's in all the gospels and and read the full story and 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 see what really what is the biggest failure of all of all. Is it is it the fact that you know Peter is so kind of braggadocious intense about it. Yeah. Yeah. So intense before, and then so intense, the, you know, the pendulum swings, uh, is it the actual act of denial in which case, you know, there are 10 other disciples that are also in that boat. Um, is it, but it getting, would, is it getting caught? Is it getting caught? Yeah. You know, I, I think what is the, what do, and, and I don't know that there's a right or wrong answer because we're talking about quality of failure, but I would say what part, or maybe the better question is what part of Peter's failure is most impactful to, to individuals yeah. in the group? You know, what is it that really like, whoa, that's, that's the jarring failure? Because I think that speaks to what an individual's kind of failure level is or their failure threshold is. Because for me, I can say for me, I'm most jarred by Peter's extreme passion 
and confidence in his faithfulness to the Lord, and then countered by this extreme, you know, uh, yeah. denial of the Lord. Because it would be one thing if he had this extreme passion, uh, vocal passion of faithfulness, and then he just as soon as the as soon as the guards showed up, he ran away. That would be a failure. But it just. You know, I, I take you to the next that, step of actually verbalizing his dis, dis, disowning Jesus, and yeah. uh, that's that. Yeah, I'm yeah. with you. I think I, that that to me is the is the is the greatest uh, standout failure for for Peter. And 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 out out of all the things where Peter has failed, I mean, he he sank in the water when he was walking on the water. You know, it was great that he was the one who said, "Let me do it." Yeah, but when he did it, he's like, "All right, dude." It didn't didn't last very long. <laughs> it didn't work. You got you, the waves were more were more important to you than Jesus in that moment. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, I would say this too. Here's another question to think about for you for your group, and it really ha- really has to do with self perception or our our own perception of God's perception of us. Mm. And uh, there are some people who go move through life, and and they're they're basic disposition is that god is mad at them mm-hmm. and so the question is how do you think god god perceives you and and the life that you are living mm-hmm. um these are the people by the way who say that i couldn't come to church because you know the, the the walls would fall in because i haven't been to church you know the subtext of that is that god is not happy with me mm-hmm and so I should not show up in the house of God because God is not happy with me. Um, to what degree is that true for anybody, you know, for each person? You know, is mm-hmm. God truly unhappy or um, is God you know, ready to say, all right, all right I, I forgive you, forgiven you. Come on, let's let's get back to let's get back mm-hmm. to life. Let's get back to playing. Yeah. And I think related to that, uh, I think a, a really uh, good kind of thought. Um, kind of question internally and with a group is is to look at what do we think Jesus' emotional state is as he's talking to Peter? Like, how does Jesus perceive Peter in this moment? Wow. Um, you know, because Peter Peter is grieved that Jesus asks him the third time, right? So, but what you know, what is so? What does Peter think Jesus thinks of him because of that? Right? Like right. just like what you said. What is Peter's perception of Jesus' perception of Peter? <laughs> you know? yeah. but, then, but then actually get into, let's, if we're in Jesus' shoes, you know, what are, how are we, what do we think Jesus, how, how, what Jesus is feeling towards Peter based on his approach? And, and if it was us and somebody else who had failed us, how would we respond? If, if, we, were, if we were actually in Jesus' shoes right now and somebody fails us, how would we respond? You know, I, I think those kind of help unpack the 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 personal question that you're that you're posing is, you know, what is Jesus' perception of me? How, how do I think Jesus sees me? Well, let me throw out throw out a couple couple of hints here for when when the answer time comes around. If you're the leader listening listening and getting ready, that uh, Peter jumps out of the boat to swim to Jesus. So let that. So govern yeah. how you how you, how you perceive what Peter was 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 thinking, yeah. and then um, the fact that that Jesus and I said a little bit more about this in the live service services that it was such an intentional act to restore Peter, mm-hmm. done in a very deliberate way. What does that tell you about how Jesus is perceiving the moment, and as as well? Yeah, yeah. The I'll last throw one more. I throw one more. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, um, and, and I just, it, it's the, um, it's, it, I was talking about it a little while ago, how can God take whatever failure that you have had in your life? Wh- what does that, what, what would it, what would the, the inverse of that failure look like if you were to think of it as a, as an, as, as a way that God would use that for some greater good? What would that look like? Chuck Colson went to prison, you know, right hand, right hand of the president of the United States in prison Prison fellowship started a whole ministry, launched a whole worldwide ministry, going on to this day. What does that look like for you? Yep. you to, with you, with your own failure. Yeah, I, I think I think that's that is the way to to kind of if you're in a group, that's the way to close it out is to to imagine a future where the failure 
does define your purpose, right? We always, we sometimes say, well, your failure doesn't define you. Your failure doesn't define you. Well, maybe it does define your purpose. It may be in, in a great way. I mean, the cross of Jesus defined the work of Jesus and the empty, because without the cross, there's no empty tomb, right? Without the cross, there's no, without the crucifixion, there's no resurrection. And I was actually talking to someone yesterday who came in struggling because they're 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 they think there's a divorce on the horizon you know and i i said you know do what you can you know talk about all the different things you know towards reconciliation but i said if the other person is really dug in and and the divorce papers come across your your table and you have to sign them uh Maybe ask God to prepare your heart and mind for the purpose that comes out of it. And, and they, they just like had never thought, it's like because if, if statistics are to be believed and 51% of marriages end in divorce, then there are other people who need the hope of Jesus Christ in the middle of their divorce. Mm. Um, and if you've got that answer and you walk through that valley of divorce— it's not, God is, it's like you said, the failure of divorce is not the enemy. Yeah. You know, letting that, letting that failure defeat you. Yeah. Is, is no, that, that's... you know, but, but God, but, but you do, you is... do learn through it. You grow through it. And, and, and there, are, there are redemptive, quali- there are redemptive acts coming out of it. Yep. Yeah. And that, and that so, you can be a help to others. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And so, and so, you know, what, and maybe, maybe, maybe a, a, a person in your group who's talking is like, I'm in the middle of it. I'm in the middle of the failure. I'm in the middle of the, the, the divorce proceeding. I'm, I'm in the middle of struggling with my kids and, and not knowing what the answer is. I'm in the middle of the financial. I, I'm not past the point of being a financial failure. I'm in the middle of failing right now. I can't, mm-hmm. you, know, I'm, you know, and I don't know, you know, so, but. The, yeah, my, my prayer at the moment is I don't want a ministry out of this failure. That's right, that's I want the right. failure to be. I want the failure to not be a failure. That's right, and and that's okay to pray that, right? That's okay to pray that. Uh, it's okay to pray that it doesn't actually come to fruition. I, I think it's good to pray that, but if it does, that doesn't mean that the failure has to be the final word. It, the failure can be the definition of your future purpose, and so. What is what could that look like? To your point, it's 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 almost yeah. like it's almost like you're you're time traveling, you know. It's like you're getting in the DeLorean and you're the going, future. To, yeah. going to the future and you're seeing yeah. what could it be if if yeah. you if we really leaned into the the restoration of Jesus on the beach, what what could it look like? I mean, for Peter, yeah. we know what it looked like. I mean, he he went and did incredible things for the for the cross and. Uh, for for the the gospel and and for the kingdom, but he wasn't perfect even after that. Same thing with David; he wasn't perfect even after that. It was, but it was purpose, right? And I think that's a that's, yeah. a, that's an important point. Um, one guy one guy one guy called that uh, play the movie forward. I'm trying to see yeah. if I see the book of nine nine things you must do. Uh, yeah. Henry Cloud. He said nine, one of the things you must do is you learn how to play the movie forward. Imagine what this thing looks like played out. That'd oh. be tremendously helpful. Great, great image, Good great image. Well, uh, next week we are going to be in week number five. We're going to be talking about uh, the Apostle Paul and his thorn in the flesh. So that'll be a fun one. Pastor John in Classic, I'm in Vine uh, once again. And uh, wherever you're at, if you have missed this week's messages in our series, uh, we encourage you to go to our website, fpclakeland.org, or you can now download the Church Center app and find complete uh, complete ser- uh, services on the, uh, the Church Center app on our website uh, by clicking on the worship page on the website or the sermon page on the Church Center app. Watch complete services, both classic and the modern uh, worship service. And wherever you're uh, experiencing this podcast, uh, we encourage you to hit the subscribe button, share it with your friends, give us a like, turn on the notification bell icon, wherever it's at, uh, so you can be notified when a new episode drops. Uh, God willing, this will also be a video. So if you're watching this on YouTube, uh, subscribe to our YouTube page, youtube.com backslash FPC Lakeland. Uh, not just armchair preaching, but uh, all the weekly services go up and there, you never know. announcements, uh, Bible studies, lots of things. 
So hit the subscribe, hit the bell icon. You, you, uh, you may love this format. We may do this every week. Oh, this particular format like this? <laughs> yeah. yeah, this might be way easier than the other way. I don't know. We'll, we'll find <laughs> out. We'll find out. Uh, well, John, thanks for uh, trudging through the uh, technological issues and for sitting. Yeah, thanks for, for, for leading that. And, yeah. uh, and have a great time with Caleb. What a great experience. Father done, father son. You know, get away. That's great. It, it, one of the ways that we try to find uh, that, that balance uh, that we were talking about earlier is to make these sorts of things a priority. So um, I appreciate it. Appreciate it. Well, I'll see you, uh, I'll see you uh, tomorrow. And for everyone else, All right, uh, safe we, will, travels. we will see everyone else uh, next time.